Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm Dick Miley's chair of Alaska Common Ground. I want to welcome you to tonight's discussion with his updates on current renewable energy legislation in Alaska, the community solar renewable energy portfolio standard bills, as well as the status of the Green Bank program. This is an update on the three topics of that were discussed at our meeting back in December on December 18th. Alaska Common Ground was founded in 1991 with the purpose of collecting and disseminating information on Alaska public issues and problems, facilitating discussions on them and seeking consensus on them and developing solutions and encouraging their adoption and implementation. A few housekeeping items here. Um, we'll start off with presentations from the speaker for each of the three bills and programs. This will take 20 to 30 minutes. If you have questions, please type them into the question feature at the bottom of your screen. We will collect these and present them to the panelists after each have made their initial presentations. This event is being recorded in case you or your friends want to watch it later. It will be available on the Alaska, oops, will be available on the Alaska Common Ground website and YouTube channel. We hope to end by 7 p.m. Alaska Common Ground could not conduct the work we do without the support of our members and donors. If you would like to support events like this, please consider becoming a member or making a donation online at akcommonground.org. Now we'd like to introduce our panels. Uh, we have three panelists, so I'll introduce each one right before they speak. The first one up is Senator Bill Wilikowski. He has served East Anchorage in the State Senate since 2007. He is currently chair of the Senate Rules Committee and vice chair of the Senate Resources Committee. He earned his BS degree and law degree from Seton Hall University and has spent most of his career in Alaska. He has served on the Northeast Community Council, Council Alaska Workers' Compensation Board, and the Creekside Town Center Committee, among many others. Outside of his legislative duties, he is an attorney with the IBEW uh, local 1547 in his free time, Senator Wilikowski. The end of his bio just disappeared on me. Senator Wilikowski enjoys fishing, skiing, and mountain biking. Senator Wilikowski, let's uh, hear about the community solar legislation. Well, thank you. Uh, great to be here. Uh, I am sponsoring a bill on uh, community energy. It started out as community solar. We've now broadened it to encompass uh, wind, potentially hydro, potentially geothermal. And so here fundamentally, what is community energy? Uh, if you have a solar panel on your house and you connect that to your house, it ultimately gets tied into the electrical grid. That's a process called net metering and you could get a reduction in your electrical bill. Let's say you generate a thousand kilowatts of uh, solar power in a month, then you would get a deduction on your bill of a, a, of a thousand kilowatts. You still pay the base rate, you still pay the underground fees if you're in Chugach service territory. Uh, but let's say you wanted to also provide power for your neighbor. Let's say you had an excess. Under current law or current regulations, you can't do that. That is, requires some changes to our law uh, to create what is known as virtual net metering. And this arises in a number of instances. We see this with condo associations. I have a, a senior center in my district, which has uh, several dozen units and would like to put solar panels on top of their roof and then provide that uh, for a number of people in the community there. They can't do it under our current law. And so what community uh, energy seeks to do is to break through that barrier and provide uh, so that the local community can go ahead either uh, through, through various organizations. It can, like I said, it can be uh, uh, co-ops, it can be a, uh, an apartment building, apartment complex, it can be a, a senior center, it could be um, a for-profit business for that matter if they wanted to the amount of energy that they can provide into the system uh, would be regulated. Every utility would create a community energy plan under the bill. And, and the, the reasoning for that is you've got to have some controls so that the uh, utility can uh, integrate the resource into their system. 
And so uh, this is something that we're seeing really explode all over the country. We're seeing uh, uh, many other states do this. 23 other states have community energy type programs. There's uh, many utilities across the country that are starting to do this. It's the fastest growing area in the renewable energy field. And it really allows local communities to empower themselves, to empower neighborhoods, streets, can do, people in um, uh, little communities can go ahead and do this. And so I'll talk a little bit about what the, the bill is. There's a, it's Senate Bill 152. And uh, there's a house companion. It's by Rep. Tomaszewski. I'm the sponsor on the Senate side. Uh, my bill is currently in the Senate and Labor and Commerce Committee. We originally drafted this bill last year, and it's been a fairly complex bill to deal with for a variety of reasons. We're dealing with all of the utilities, each one of whom has their own specific concerns that we've been trying to address. And so we've been working with utilities. It's uh, a little bit of a complex bill to get drafted with legislative legal. And so uh, we, we have had uh, hearings on this in the Senate Labor and Commerce Committee. I'm very optimistic about it. Uh, it, but it still has a ways to go. I think we've gotten to the point now where we've worked out many of the concerns with the utilities. And now we're in the final drafting phase. The chairman of the committee is Senator Bjorkman. He's told us, hey, go work out the differences that you have with utilities and hopefully come back with a compromise package. And I, I think that's where we are. Uh, Bill has widespread support um, from many different people, many different organizations. And um, uh, there, there are a number of advantages to doing this, and it, uh, we think in, in the long term, it will end up lowering the energy costs for uh, Alaskans because we're facing a natural gas shortage in Cook Inlet. As many of you are aware, just a few weeks ago, we almost ran out of gas in Cook Inlet, and the expectation is that contracts for natural gas uh, which are predominantly controlled by Hillcorp will start to expire in the next couple of years. And the rates that they will charge for that natural gas are expected to increase exponentially. You could see a doubling or tripling of those gas costs, natural gas costs in the next uh, probably five years or so. And so with that, your energy bills will go up. If we can put more small scale renewable energy projects like via the community energy uh, bill, into the system that will offset the amount of natural gas that we have to use and therefore keep help keep electrical uh, generation costs somewhat in check, somewhat in check. Um, the other thing uh, that this does is it, uh, there are uh, billions of dollars, we estimate about $7 billion in federal funds that are available for community energy projects. Uh, there are private uh, investors who are very interested in pursuing this. This will create renewable energy jobs. There, Alaska is last in the United States in the number of solar energy jobs that we create. This, we think, will lead to uh, a, a number of other uh, renewable energy jobs throughout the state. Uh, it will improve our grid resiliency. When you have more and uh, varying sources of energy on in the Cook Inlet uh, uh, basin, in, in the grid, on the rail belt, that improves our resiliency. We actually have an electrical system in Cook Inlet that is that is very old, very archaic, and would not even, quite frankly, be approved if it were in the lower 48. This enhances our grid resilience, and it allows uh, numerous small organizations to participate in this. And um, I, I'm very excited about this bill. I'm hopeful that we can get it passed this year. And um, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Senator Wilikowski. Next up is Senator Lukey Tobin. Senator Tobin was born and raised in Nome. Um, she is a University of Alaska Anchorage graduate and holds a master's degree in rural development from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, the Peace, their Peace Corps Master's International Program, having served as a youth development volunteer and in as Becker's, and I'm going to butcher this country's name as. As Burge, I, ah, I'll let her pronounce the name of that um, country that's in uh, Central Asia. Anyhow, she was there from 2008 to 2011. Currently, she's a PhD candidate at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Her research topic is focused on culturally responsive education. Senator Tobin has worked in marketing and communications for Alaska nonprofits like Boys and Girls, Coeric, and the Community 
Alaska Community Foundation. She was also a certified fundraiser for the Anchorage Museum at Rasmussen Center. Um, she will be providing an update on the Renewable Portfolio Standard, Senate Bill 101, House Bill 121. Senator Tobin, take it away. Thank you. And for those who are curious, uh, the country was Azerbaijan, uh, which unfortunately is currently ended its ceasefire with Armenia and is forcibly removing 2.4 million Armenians from their homelands. It's been a really difficult situation to watch uh, and to navigate, particularly as I continue to support the communities of Azerbaijan uh, with my efforts and energy here in Alaska. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. I want to start by just rooting us all in why I am such a passionate advocate for renewable energy generation. Uh, you may have heard me talk about the fact that last year, the average surface temperatures for the Arctic were the sixth warmest uh, since 1900s. And the summer surface temperatures, July through September, were the warmest on record uh, since we began actually enumerating those temperatures. I was listening to Alaska News Nightly a few days ago and heard Brian Brent Schneider share that this last winter was the warmest that we've had on record. And knowing that the earlier the snow melts and the contribute and how that contributes to hot and drier summers means that we are going to have more wildfires and really we're going to see poor air quality. And I think about this because I am of childbearing age and many of my friends are having young kiddos, and I want there to be a planet for them to thrive in. And this is really what brought me to uh, this space around how can I make a difference? What can I do to really move the needle besides trying to purchase all of my meat locally, besides using cloth shopping bags, besides changing my light bulbs and thinking about how I build my home to use the best quality materials and also the materials that will uh, reduce my energy footprint. Well, I talked with some of my partners and we came out with an excellent idea that actually has been uh, introduced in the legislature previously by the governor, and that is Senate Bill 101. And what Senate Bill 101 does is it sets a renewable portfolio standard for the state of Alaska. And that really is about how we set expectations for energy generation throughout our state. This bill particularly focuses in on the rail belt, and it sets a goal of 25% energy generated by renewable technologies by 2027. The next benchmark is by 2035, having 55% of our energy generation on the rail belt to be produced by renewables, and by 2040, 80%. And it is notable that we have not made a goal of 100%, and that is because we recognize Alaska is a unique space, it has unique needs. We have communities that deal with some pretty extreme climates. And understandably, we're still developing that technology. And I do believe we'll get there. I spend a lot of time in education policy and I see the incredible things our kiddos are doing. And I am pretty confident they're gonna solve all the problems. This last weekend, I was able to attend the climate conference at the University of Alaska Anchorage and listening to a Pecha Kucha presentation about how to drink more beer in a renewable fashion uh, really reminded me that our young kids are thinking about all the angles and they're doing some really incredible work. So I'm jazzed because I think setting the expectation starts us on the right pathway and they're going to get us across the finish line. I think pieces that we need to remember, and Senator Wilkowski kind of kicked us off on this, is that we're entering into a crisis with our liquid natural gas contracts. We know that as we continue to have less production coming out of the Cook Inlet, we are going to end up seeing some pretty, uh, inc some pretty incredible costs, some increasing costs. And understandably, here in the legislature, we don't want to see that. We want to see we wanna see energy policy and also energy generation that really focuses on providing that relief to uh, the, the purchaser. So I have a solution and that solution is incredibly quick deployment of renewable technologies. We have the technology to do that today and this bill sets a very aggressive timeline to hit that 55% mark, which we believe that once you hit 55%, 
you really are just uh, cooking with gas at that point, as some like to say. I'm working on my puns. A lot of my colleagues use a lot of really ridiculous puns, and I'm trying to up my pun game. One of the pieces, our bill, is a little bit different than uh, Senator Wilikowski's with regards to net metering is in the legislation that I've introduced, we actually include annual net metering, which provides the opportunity for an individual to sell its excess uh, energy that's produced by a renewable back to their utility at a retail rate for an entire year period. So if you're not producing as much energy in the winter months, you're able to carry those cost savings through. One of the pieces that's really important to me, especially uh, being born and raised in rural Alaska, is the definitions that are included in the legislation. SB 101 maintains a definition of renewable energy that does not include coal or nuclear. And that's very critical to me because many of you uh, might have attended some recent talks by Dan O'Neill, uh, really highlighting the impacts of nuclear experimentation in indigenous communities in Alaska. And I am one that believes very strongly in community voice and community input. And I do not wanna create a legislation that would supersede or override the ability for a community to pick the right technology uh, that's best for their, their areas. So we keep those particular technologies out of our legislation. Uh, arguably, they're not renewable. Uh, no matter what people say, they're still something that is produced that is bad for the environment. And we want to really focus in on those technologies that are gonna be best for our communities. Uh, I do wanna pair this with some other legislation that has been introduced in the legislature. In the House, we have seen HB 368, which was introduced by the House Energy Committee. That is, and what I often think of as a companion to a renewable portfolio standard, and that is a clean energy standard. In that legislation, they open up that definition of renewable to a clean energy generation definition, which uh, authorizes coal, nuclear, and carbon sequestration to be included in the technologies used to reduce our carbon footprint. That bill also takes a different approach comparative to Senate Bill 101, the renewable portfolio standard, which uses a fee-based structure to incentivize and keep uh, our utilities producing energy through renewables. House Bill 368 uses an incentive tax structure. So they give tax credits uh, for energy generation through clean technologies. Uh, the good news is I have a great relationship with the, the sponsor of that bill. And we've been really talking about how we might be able to find synergy between these two separate approaches and really find a way to get to yes. I'm a big advocate of getting to yes, as many of you know. Uh, the last but not least, that I really want to just remind folks of is that this bill was introduced by the governor uh, in the 32nd legislature. It is a bipartisan piece of legislation. My cross sponsor in the house is Representative Jesse Sumner, who uh, arguably sits on a different side of the aisle than I do and has kind of a different approach to things, but our goal is the same. Our goal is to generate more energy uh, by deployment of renewables. And I'm excited and thrilled to hopefully get to a place where these pieces of legislation move forward. The unfortunate reality is similar to, to Senator Wilikowski, my bill is stuck in Senate Labor and Commerce. Uh, one of the pieces that I continue to hear is that our utilities are just not on board. And understandably, not everyone is going to see the world through the lens that I see it. And trying to figure out a pathway forward uh, is important work. And it's why I've brought on uh, somewhat of an expert in this space into my office to help us have those difficult conversations and, and figure out a way to get to yes. I have strong belief that there will be some level of energy package coming out of the Alaska legislature this year and key components that I've identified tonight will be included in that final package and that will get us farther along in the conversation. And, and I will remind us all once again, we have to get to yes, we have to generate more energy through renewables. We need to be really thinking about how we reduce our impact on our climate. We reduce uh, the impacts of wildfires, of typhoons, of everything that's hurting the Arctic at a greater level because our future demands it. Our kids need us to stand up for them today. And if we don't, uh, they're not gonna have a planet to inherit. And last I checked, uh, we're not building colonies on the moon yet. And we're definitely not gonna to get to Mars anytime soon. So we've gotta take care of the planet that we have right now. Thanks, Dick. 
Thank you, Senator Tobin. Next up is Chris Rose. Chris Rose is the founder and executive director of the Renewable Energy Alaska Project, also known as REAP. He has worked as a fundraiser for various, for various nonprofit public interest groups around the United States, receiving his law degree from the University of Oregon with a certificate in environmental and natural resources law. For 12 years, his private practice in Alaska included representation of native Alaskans from Northwest Alaska Village and the mediation of a variety of disputes around the state. He has been very active in local community affairs and has served on various statewide boards, including the Renewable Energy Grant Fund Advisory Committee. And today he will be giving us update on the Green Bank legislation, Senate Bill 125, House Bill 154. Chris? Thanks, Dick, and thanks for the invitation to be here this evening. Um, for those folks who don't know about Renewable Energy Alaska Project, uh, we have been around since 2004, uh, focused on energy education and advocacy. We also do a lot of training and workforce development because even if we have all the best technology in the world and we have a lot of money to put it in, if we don't have the people to op actually operate and maintain it, we're not gonna be able to succeed. And I think that's a good segue to the Green Bank Bill, as you mentioned, House Bill 154, Senate Bill 125. REAP has been advocating for a Green Bank for six or seven years. Uh, we were strong advocates uh, back in the 2008 time period and then beyond to get more money to the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation at that time, who was uh, supporting and administering more than $640 million for energy efficiency around the state. Quite successful programs, the rebate program and the program that gave uh, people who had below median income grants to weatherize their homes. More than 50,000 homes in the state were weatherized and energy efficiency is always our best bet. It's the, it's the low hanging fruit. It's what we should be doing more of. And as we realized the state's budget was not gonna be able to sustain hundreds of millions of dollars in grants and rebates for people to do energy efficiency, we began looking around at other ideas. Green Bank popped up immediately, particularly the Connecticut Green Bank, which was the first green bank in, in the country to get established in 2010. Super successful now uh, in its 14th year and doing hundreds of millions of dollars of loans for uh, energy efficiency and rooftop solar in Connecticut. The idea behind a green bank is that typically uh, the uh, private banks don't yet understand that they can make money lending uh, to people who want to borrow it to do energy efficiency and rooftop solar. I liken it to the, uh, the fact that when cars were invented, you could not go out and get a car loan. The banks at that time had no idea what a car was or the risk profile of a car. And there were many, many years before people could get a car loan. And now you can get a car loan for 0% interest and drive it off the lot. And this is a item that depreciates right away, not an item that makes your house uh, more efficient, saves you money, uh, makes you more productive, uh, and so it, it seems that it makes a lot of sense for us to be able to find a way to provide affordable loans for people to do uh, weatherization and building upgrades, whether it be commercial or residential or even a community building. So we realized that the, the uh, Green Bank model made sense because what happens is a quasi-governmental entity, uh, in this case, would be the uh, Alaska Housing Finance Corporation, where the Green Bank would be housed, does the heavy lifting up front of designing loan programs and loan products that the private sector banks are not typically doing, not quite yet at least. And then they invite those, green, uh, those uh, private sector banks into those products and into those programs once they're established. And the idea is most of the money that actually goes out through uh, the green bank for loans to people is coming from those private sector banks. So the, the state entity, in this case, HFC, would be able to leverage a modest amount of state money to get more and more private banks interested in developing uh, or, or putting money into loan programs. Uh, ultimately, what happens is the contractors who are doing the work, whether it's the weatherization contractors or uh, rooftop solar installers are the ones who do all the marketing because they're the ones who are gonna be going out telling people, hey, did you know you could get a low cost loan and give uh, and and have enough time to pay it back where 
you actually are going to have a cash flow neutral or even a cash flow positive loan experience. And once they tell homeowners or building owners that the building owners uh, can just do all the paperwork straight through uh, those contractors. And so we have the built-in marketing of the people who are actually going to be doing the doing the work. Lots and lots and lots of potential jobs here. REPA has done its own back of the envelope analysis on rooftop solar alone. In Anchorage, if only about 30% of the buildings that face south put solar on, we could generate about 8% of Anchorage's electricity and save literally billions of cubic feet of natural gas that uh, both Senator Wilkowski and Senator Tobin mentioned um, is, is a, a commodity that we are really um, at the end of in terms of economic natural gas. And we're looking at importing natural gas in just a few short years. So anything and everything we can do to conserve energy, make energy efficiency a top priority is important. Because this bill actually went through the legislature um, a, a few years ago, and was going to be at that point housed at ADA, I think the legislature, at least many of the legislators are pretty comfortable with the concept. We don't see a lot of opposition to the concept. The bill died two years ago because people did not want to see it housed at ADA. It got reintroduced by the governor in April of last year and had a couple of hearings. And now it is still um, you know, really close to the finish line, uh, has only uh, house finance and Senate finance to get through before it can go to the respective floors and hopefully become law this year. So it's in Senate finance. Uh, it's had a couple of hearings in Senate finance this year. Um, I think people who are interested in, in pushing this bill forward could write letters uh, to the co-chairs of the Senate Finance Committee, encouraging that committee to hear that bill and move it to the Senate uh, Rules Committee and then the floor. Uh, likewise, in the House, if people are interested in pushing this bill forward, uh, letters to the co-chairs of the, uh, the House Finance Committee uh, would be helpful and, and appropriate at this time. We have about six weeks left and, and hopefully we'll get this over the finish line. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Chris. And uh, folks who have questions, put them in the Q&A. And um, the first question up here is, um, the average home in Anchorage has an energy usage intensity of 127 KB2000, I guess it is, uh, BTUs uh, per square foot per year, most of which is wasted heat. We have retrofitted our 1950s home over the last two years from 93 to 35 um, thousand BTUs um, per year. What is the role of energy efficiency in solving the Cook Inlet energy shortfall issue with proliferation of low cost sensors? and consumer energy data now widely available. Why is efficiency being overlooked by state leaders as the procurable resource it could clearly be? I don't know who wants to try to answer that one. Uh, I could take a stab at it. And it's funny because I think I know who asked this question. I just had a conversation about this with this person earlier today. So um, yeah, it, there's a huge opportunity to uh, reduce our energy use. Uh, and I think the person I was uh, speaking of has a, installed a heat pump. Heat pumps are not for everybody yet, but you know, in a state that also gets very cold, Maine, they've installed more than 100,000 heat pumps in the last five years. Um, one of the big issues we've got right now is two thirds of cooking the gas is going to heating. So even if we were completely 100% renewable on the electricity side, we'd still have a gas issue. And so uh, we have to be thinking about ways to get the upfront capital into people's hands. And I think that's what the Green Bank is. So I don't think the legislature is ignoring this at all. I think they've supported the Green Bank concept for a while. I think it's close to the finish line. A Green Bank could loan people money to not only do energy efficiency upgrades, but also put in uh, efficient appliances and things like heat pumps. Um, that are really ubiquitous all around the world. I mean, people are using heat pumps in cold climates in other places. And I saw a heat pump that's being tested down to minus 31 at the Cold Climate Housing Research Center up in Fairbanks just a couple months ago. So I think there are opportunities uh, for efficiency and conservation um, in existing legislation and also tons of federal money that we could be leveraging if we can just get the upfront capital into people's hands. And I think one of the really important pieces is that uh, the legislature did provide resources for a home energy rebate program previously, and we've seen significant successes uh, in the deployment of those resources. I know 
uh, that since 2007, we've seen a pretty significant reduction in uh, gas usage across rail belts because of that program. And so I know that that's still being discussed and talked about. And one of the pieces I really appreciate in the Inflation Reduction Act is uh, resources for our public schools to do some energy retrofits and to weatherize their facilities. And that's the next big step is our school facilities need to have those improvements because they are some of the biggest energy draws in much of our communities. And I'm glad Senator Tillman mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act too, because the Greenhouse, Reduction, uh, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is part of that, $27 billion. That's going to be um, put out in the, this month, probably before the end of this week, we expect EPA to announce uh, who is going to be getting uh, money in three different pots. And HFC and AEA jointly uh, put in for $100 million for uh, solar uh, in the Solar for all, all program. So there's a ton of potential here. If we can just get the upfront capital into people's hands, um, and if that means a low cost loan, uh, we can get started. Thank you. Then the next question, Senator Tobin answered online, but for those who didn't see that, the question was, are there any plans for creating microgrids for rural communities that are currently off grid? Senator Tobin, you want to, so everybody can hear your answer? I'm more than happy to share it here. You know, one of the things I really appreciate about Senate Bill 101, which we worked on with our partners from REAP, as well as other advocates uh, of renewable technology, is that in the bill, we authorize renewable energy credits. And those credits come from uh, renewable energy production. And one of the key pieces is that those credits can be purchased from renewable resources that are located within a utility that serves a PCE or provides PCE. So although the bill is focused on rail belt utilities and really deploying renewable technology in the rail belt, there are some provisions that allow for uh, that intersection with rural communities. And I'm looking forward to continuing to work on that and expand that, but I think this is a really good first step. If I may add two other connections to rural Alaska, one is the PCE program. As our electric rates go up in Anchorage and Fairbanks, the floor of the PCE program keeps going up and up and up to the point where there's less and less to actually equalize. And so if we can get our electric rates in, in the rail belt under control, it helps rural Alaska. Also, I've been told by many people who are running renewable energy grids in rural Alaska that it would help for us to have a much more robust renewable energy industry in the rail belt. Right now, some of these communities in rural Alaska are actually importing technicians from outside Alaska, from the lower 48, to come up here and work on these systems. And we should be getting people from Anchorage and Fairbanks to go out there, not folks from outside. Just a, a follow up on that is the lack of uh, skilled people. So the lack of skilled people in, in Alaska, or is it a lack of the marketing them, themselves to rural Alaska? I, I'm I not sure I heard that part of that question. I, I I'd say it, it's both, Dick. You 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 definitely have job shortages uh, all across the state. We need more skilled people doing renewable energy. And, uh, and that is a, a huge, huge issue right now for our state. I know in, in the electrical industry, you, you have problems hiring uh, linemen, you have problems getting wiremen, you have problems getting all, you know, people in all, all spheres. Uh, it's a big problem in the construction industry. Um, statewide, we've got, um, I think around 20% vacancy rate in our state workforce, uh, public workforce. So it, it is a big problem all across the state. Okay, next question up, do you, do any of you know of vendors in Anchorage who are installing heat pumps? If so, please post info. That's probably a question for Chris. Hello, Senator Tobin, do you, I see you raising your hand there. <laughs> no, no, I, I've been trying to convince my husband to uh, put a heat pump into our home as we have in-floor heating, which we've seen uh, a lot of research come out that uh, some of the best um, usages of heat pumps is with in-floor heating. Uh, and I'm I'm working on him. He says that I need to pass some renewable portfolio standards before he'll let me put solar banners on. So I'm hoping that I can get this across the finish line so that I can get all the things that I want. There's not enough people doing this. 
uh, in Southeast Alaska, where there's a lot more heat pumps, they also have a shortage even there. So uh, a great opportunity for people growing up who want to get into this kind of line of work. There are many things like heat pumps that uh, people could um, you it, do as a career. But I think one of the things you asked, Dick, was it, it, is, a mar is it a chicken egg thing? And I think it is. I mean, if we had more of a market, a sustainable market, through a thing, through something like a green bank or other state policy that would give certainty to people who want to get trained up to do something that it's not going to just be a five year, um, you know, training that ends uh, when there's no more jobs and there's no more business. Then we'd have a lot more people training for these jobs if they could see it as a career. Thank you. Uh, this is a question that actually came in by email. We haven't heard much about the development of hydrogen as a fuel. From what I've read, it's safer and cheaper than mining the material for electric batteries. Is that on the table or in the discussion for Alaska? Anybody want to talk about hydrogen as a fuel? Well, it's happening all over the world. Alaska Marine Power, which is one of the independent power producers that we're lucky to have in Alaska, is looking at uh, doing offshore wind uh, in Southern Cook Inlet, where the capacity factors are over 60%. To give you some perspective, that's more capacity than Bradley Lake, which is only 50%. Although we can't control it, it's a very huge resource. And uh, they're looking at the possibility of making that uh, electric, that uh, renewable electricity straight into hydrogen uh, and then using that to sell to industry. So there are many folks, I think, who are, are looking at the the possibility of using our vast renewable energy resources, not just for electricity, but to make uh, a, a, a use, use of that electricity to do electrolysis and make hydrogen. Thank you, Chris. Next question, has there been any thought towards the state facilities taking the lead by example, investing to increase energy efficiency and or installing rooftop solar, for example, in state buildings or other state facilities? So I, I think um, an interesting component of that, and I just want to mention is Senator Begich had a bill to actually do this a few years ago through energy performance contracting, which is something we saw with a previous bill, House Bill 310. And it was successfully deployed for state facilities that were 10,000 square feet or larger. Senator Begich's bill would have dropped it to 5,000 square feet. Unfortunately, a, a court case uh, established that energy performance contracting uh, creates unconstitutional debt. And so if anyone has a solution to that problem, I've been looking for an answer because I think we could do this very easily. And it was very successful. Uh, I think AEA met their goal of energy retrofits of state facilities uh, five years faster than was established in that legislation. But sorry, Bill, I cut you off. Oh, yeah. We well back uh, must have been 2010. Um, Senator McGuire and I chaired the Senate Resources Committee. And I think, Chris, maybe you were involved in that one as well. We passed uh, Senate Bill 220, which was the Alaska Sustainable Energy Act. We traveled all across the state. And one of our provisions in that bill was to require the state, all state facilities do an evaluation and audit and to uh, uh, retrofit and become more energy efficient. And, and we get a report every uh, every session on that. And that, that has saved, um, uh, I don't want to over, it, it's a significant amount of energy. I'd say dozens of megawatts of power and a significant cost savings to the state as well. But a lot more to do. Yeah, I mean, one of the dilemmas for school districts is that if a, if a school reduces its energy usage, it doesn't necessarily benefit from you know, that money kind of coming back to their budget so they can hire another teacher. It just means that the school district typically says, okay, great, good job. Your budget's now lower because you're not using as much energy. So we got to find a way to incentivize uh, uh, these public buildings to do more energy efficiency. And I think something that always surprises folks is that schools are exempt from PCE. So their energy costs are very different than the surrounding communities in our rural areas. Hey, uh, question slash comment here. Mixed messages regarding heat pumps and related water heating. What gives? Is it effective here or not? And we need updated info. Anybody want to address the heat pump issue? It is. Well, I'll start and then I'm sure Chris can jump in. It is effective. I know 
again, back when we toured the state uh, looking for energy solutions 12, 13 years ago, they were doing projects in Fairbanks. The technology has improved significantly. I think this is really uh, something that you're going to see used. It, it's, it's more challenging the further north you go. It's more challenging in Fairbanks than it is in, in uh, certainly in Anchorage and Juneau, but it is absolutely effective. The Sea Life Center is using uh, heat pumps. They're, they're in the ocean. Uh, they use that for a significant source of their energy. I know I've got some facilities uh, in my district in Muldoon, Cook Inlet Housing is using it. So it absolutely is uh, something that can work. And it's something that with federal uh, rebates is becoming much more economic for uh, for users. There's uh, a I, great, I uh, oops, sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Oh, there's a, a great article in the Anchorage Daily News um, dated March 6th that uh, talks about how the Northwest Arctic Borough just received $55 million in dollars from the federal infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, to deploy heat pumps. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of investment in that, and we know that the technology uh, is there and is, is quickly evolving, and the hope is that there'll be heat pump in every home in the Northwest Arctic Borough, which I'm excited as my father still lives in Nome, and his heating bill last month was my entire PFD from last year. It is ridiculous how much folks in rural communities are paying to heat their homes, and they shouldn't have to do that. And they're using solar in places like Shugnak above the Arctic Circle to run those heat pumps. So this is where the annual net metering that Senator Tobin talked about that's in Senate 101 really comes in. Because if, if you can bank your retail credits from excess production in the summer, you're incentivized to put up a bigger system. And if you put up a bigger system, you can do more things like heat pumps. One of the things you, you know, have to remember with heat pumps is they run electricity. If our electricity prices from the grid, from natural gas prices, go up 20 to 25, 30 cents, 35 cents a kilowatt hour, it, it makes heat pumps less attractive. If you can produce your own electricity in the summer months to run your heat pump during the winter, not only are you saving natural gas for the grid, but you're definitely saving yourself a lot of money. Okay, there was an earlier question that was, I think, partially answered. Um, people asking specifically where, what the, what committees, for example, are the bills currently in, and are there hearings scheduled for some of those bills in the um, near future? And if not, are there chair people or legislators that people should be lobbying? I think Chris addressed that for. Um, for your part of this, but uh, maybe Senator Wilikowski and Senator Tobin, uh, how where where are the legislation that you're uh, advocating for in terms of committees, potential hearings, and people that they sh on line here that sh who who should they lobby for moving these forward? My my bill, community energy bill, is Senate Bill 152. It is in the Senate Labor and Commerce Committee. That's chaired by Senator uh, Jesse Bjorkman, who's from the Kiski. And, but I would I would suggest that you con everyone contact their legislator, because uh, it, you may have one particular legislator who wants to hold up a bill, but if they're getting pressured by other legislators in the building in their caucus, um, it's it's a team effort. It really is a group effort, and the pressure needs to be applied all over. Ditto. Okay, folks online, we're open for questions. I think we've um, addressed all the incoming questions. Uh, Griffin Hagel Forster has put some information in the Q&A, but I don't think he has any questions at this point. He had questions earlier, um, but maybe we'll hold on. A, oh, we just got one come in. Do any of these bills help bring along more energy storage capability? I realize storage tends to be more short term. Any thoughts on energy storage? Well, I can address it from the natural gas Ener energy. You know, um, there there is some discussion in our community energy bill to add provisions that would maybe even allow for extra compensation for uh, storage if people put in storage uh, batteries in their um, solar or uh, wind facilities uh, and that's 
because it would allow it would allow the energy utility companies, electrical utility companies, to maybe smooth out their their uh, their load use a little better. Um, on the gas side, you know, we're we still rely on gas, and we still build, will be relying on natural gas for a number of years. There are bills to address uh, storage, natural gas storage. That is becoming increasingly very critical to our ability to provide heat and electricity in the rail belt. There are bills addressing gas storage. Yeah, I would add that there are battery energy storage systems either built already on the Southern Kenai Peninsula or being built in South Central um, and, and in Fairbanks being replaced. That will all play a role. Um, I'd also mention that uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory just published a study March 4th that demonstrates that the least cost pathway forward for the rail belt is to deploy more renewable energy. And that is going to take probably more storage, not just from energy, or excuse me, from batteries, but as uh, Senator Wilikowski pointed out, uh, natural gas, because what we're doing when we are using wind and solar is displacing natural gas that would otherwise be used to generate electricity. We need a place to put that so that we've got it on the cold, dark days when we need it for the heating. Um, we also have storage in in the um, in our hydro. Uh, they, those those that's long term storage. And if we can run the grid as a unit, like most places do, if we can actually dispatch the whole rail belt from Fairbanks to Homer, uh, and that's a transmission and operations issue, uh, then we're gonna be able to use all of our resources a lot more efficiently, uh, and we'll be able to trade storage up and down the rail belt. And that's not something we're doing very effectively yet. Okay, another question's come in regarding energy storage. Are there any projects looking at gravity batteries on a large scale? Not in Alaska that I that I know of. Okay, next question. This is coming from Paul Seaton, former legislator down in Homer. Has net metering with battery storage that the resident leases to the utility, which can draw down the electricity in the evening when it needs it the most. Any chance of doing that in Alaska? Yeah. Hey, Paul, good to uh, hear from you. Uh, yeah, our community energy bill, uh, we're, we are looking at uh, that. We think that's an important component because, again, that smooths out the need uh, for the uh, grid. And... Um, and we absolutely are looking into including provisions that can do that in our net uh, community energy bill. Okay, thank you. Any more questions out there? We'll give you a few more minutes to send in your questions. Sandy Rabinowich has a question, a comment, not a question. Installed three years ago, our seven solar panels installed in a second story wall have lowered our annual electric bills by 50%. These things really work. Yeah, I guess I could add that if you think about these things in unison, um, we can really provide a huge internal rate of return for people. If you can get the upfront capital to put solar up, and you've got an incentive to put up a bigger project uh, because you're getting annual net metering, and you can get the 30% tax credit, we've calculated that that basically uh, turns into about a 14 or 15% uh, internal rate of return for somebody. And so it's, it's a, an excellent investment for people. You can get the tax credit, but you can't get the tax credit unless you spend the money. And if you don't have the money up front, you don't get started. Um, and, and so I, I would emphasize that uh, annual net metering really can play a role here um, to to juice all of this stuff while we still have eight and a half years with the tax credits and while we have a gas shortage, because this is the time we really need to be uh, doing as much as we can uh, across the board. And the nice thing about rooftop solar is it adds capacity and energy to the grid without the utilities spending any money because all that money is coming from the individuals and from the federal government.
I'm going to dovetail off Chris's comments and just really also emphasize something that Bill said earlier is this is all intersectional, that when we are not investing in our school systems, we're not producing the folks that are going to be building these systems of uh, energy production that are taking care of these facilities. When we think about our needs around food security and energy production for uh, hopefully deploying more local food production, this all intersects into why all of this is a yes and. Uh, I love this work because you get to learn so much and you get to be immersed in some really neat things. I'm gonna tell you a word I learned recently, which is agrivoltaics. This idea of mixing your solar panel farms with your actual farming and things that we could be doing here in Alaska to really uh, create a space that I hope is you know, zombie apocalypse proof that we are ready and able to be nimble so that anything that's thrown at us, particularly when it comes to climate change, Alaska is ready for it. And I get jazzed because I get to work with you guys and I get to work with these fine fellows in figuring out how we make it all happen. And it's gonna happen. I have the energy to make it happen and I am positive. Okay, here's a comment slash question. Doesn't the natural gas shortage in Cook Inlet overshadow this discussion in these bills? Chris said that heating uses two thirds of the natural gas in the rail belt. If we run out of natural gas during extremely cold periods, there will be catastrophic damage to buildings and infrastructure as well as loss of life. Not to mention the natural gas plays a critical role in integrating new renewable energy and increased costs of imported LNG will actually facilitate more renewables. Shouldn't the legislature and all rail belt residents be focused on gas supply? I, I'll take a crack at that. I, there, there's short-term solutions, there's long-term solutions, there's mid-range mid things that we have to look at. And uh, absolutely, Cook Inlet Gas remains a focus, and it is something that we've had numerous hearings on, and it is absolutely something that the legislature is focused on. And, you know, the, the challenge that we have in Cook Inlet is we have um, an enormous amount of gas, 19 trillion cubic feet, to put that in perspective in the course of our you know, state's history, we've only used about 10 trillion cubic feet. So we've got an enormous supply of gas, but we have one producer, uh, Hillcorp, that controls 90% of it. And they're, um, in, you know, quite frankly, have a consent decree that requires them to, to produce the gas and a, and a lease obligation that requires them to produce the gas, and they're not producing it. And so there's um, a lot of discussions on ways that we use carrot and a stick approach to get more gas. There's, uh, and of course there's gas storage, which as Chris mentioned is, is really critical. That acts as a battery, but, but really you've, you're looking long-term, we have a lot of renewable energy resources here. We have tremendous wind, we have tremendous solar resources. And, and what those do, those uh, limit the amount of gas. If we're in this situation where we have a limited amount of natural gas being produced, then we have to limit the amount of natural gas long-term. And as you limit that amount of natural gas and put more renewable on, that does alleviate the electrical issue. But you're right, it doesn't, it doesn't solve the heating problem right now. And so by saving the gas for the future, you'll, you'll, you extend out the life of Cook Inlet. And, um, but yeah, absolutely, we are looking at it uh, on the state level and the resources committees, and it is a critical issue short-term for sure. We're, we're hyper-focused at REAP um, on this issue of how are we going to import LNG? If we sign a long-term contract for LNG, we will freeze this region out of our opportunity to take advantage of the eight and a half years of tax credits that are left. So, you know, if we, if we do an all requirements, take or pay contract for gas, we're not going to be investing in renewables. So it's, it's really important for, for folks to be thinking about, yes, if we do have to invest in LNG imports, how do we do that? And for how long? Um, and, and pushing off that uh, decision for as long as possible is something we can do uh, with more renewable energy that we can deploy quickly. There are wind and solar projects in the pipeline right now that are being considered by utilities in the rail belt that could bring us from 15% renewable electricity in the grid now to literally 45 in just a few years. A week ago, very quickly to almost half renewable energy. And the nice thing about wind and solar is they can get built very quickly. And going back to what Senator Wilkowski says, we have to have the short, middle and long-term solutions and wind and solar are kind of medium-term solutions. Uh, energy efficiency is a short-term solution we can do right now. 
Thank you. We'll take uh, two more questions here and then we'll give everybody a chance to for a short concluding statement. But the uh, next question, we are trying to find a company to install a geothermal system in Fairbanks. And although they were here before, they're not available now. What can we do to get geothermal to Fairbanks? Or... I mean, strictly geothermal, the, the geothermal resources are you know, quite frankly, not fantastic. It, it, if you're talking heat pumps, there are certainly heat pump resources. Um, but the geothermal assets that we have, you got chain of hot springs, but even chain of hot springs was sort of groundbreaking when it was done. It was it was a, a lower heat, it, you know, compared to Iceland, which is a very hot geothermal resource. Um, the the resources that we have in the in the sort of urban areas or close to urban areas are 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 they're just not. Um, that great at this point that uh, we've discovered. Okay, the last question we'll take. It is my impression that the utilities are reluctant to pursue renewable energy to some ex to any extent. Is this the case? And thanks for your perseverance on these issues. Uh, I'll take that. I, I think there is a reluctance. Uh, it's based upon uh, doing something for 50, 60 years that's been relatively relatively easy. Um, change takes uh, more effort and energy. Uh, integrating variable renewables on the grid um, is going to be different for the utilities, but we need to support them. We need uh, regulatory certainty from the RCA so they can hire the right people. They can hire younger people who understand how to do this. They can buy the right software. This is no longer a technical issue for the rail belt. It is a cultural and institutional issue for the rail belt. And um, I would just put in a, a plug for Senate Bill 217, which addresses two of the barriers to getting more renewable energy. Uh, one of them is getting rid of the wheeling tariffs, the pancaking wheeling tariffs we've all heard about for a long time. And also uh, treating independent property producers who want to come in and take all the risk to build these projects, giving treating them like co-ops when it comes to local property taxes. Uh, right now, the policy rationale for not taxing co-ops is they would just have to pass that property tax cost on to consumers. And the same applies to independent property producers who want to sell electricity to those co-ops who then sell to consumers. So we believe the Senate Bill 217 is a bill that um, could move and uh, would really solve two important problems that uh, are really a, are, are barriers to uh, the utilities doing more and, and operating the grid more efficiently. Senator Wolikowski or Senator Tobin, do you want to add anything more to that topic? I, I think there has been a reluctance over the years by the utilities to add a renewable energy. And I think part of the problem, at least initially, stemmed from the in, there were integration issues. I know uh, years ago, we put in funding to spur Fire Island. We to, it was a, This was a, something that uh, Harry Crawford, uh, Representative Crawford, really pushed hard on to get a, a submarine line from Beluga over to the mainland, uh, over to Anchorage. <laughs> and um, and so we did fund that, but there were a lot of integration problems when that first came on. And I know that they they had to keep the gas turbine spinning while even while the wind was blowing. And so it really didn't result in cost savings initially, but but as time has gone on, there is there has been a sea change in the utilities and an, and an acceptance that they have to adopt renewable energy strategies and, and in fact, they're going out and actively looking for them. In fact, uh, you look at Golden Valley, their they're supply uh, elect electricity to some of the larger mines up there. The mines are being pressured to go towards more renewable energy. And so we're seeing this. Uh, the, the cor many corporations are being pushed by their shareholders to adopt more renewable energy. And uh, that's uh, trickling down to the utilities. And so, yeah, absolutely, there's much more uh, openness by the utilities to address to support renewable energy. I think the only thing that I want to add is uh, we talked about it earlier. Uh, some of our utilities are starting to really make investments in battery storage, and I think this is a pretty significant signal. Uh, we do have a letter of support for SB 101 uh, from my utility, uh, the largest utility in the state. And that really showcases to me that we are putting the right people in the right positions to really think about what comes next for Alaska. Yeah, I would just put a plug in also for the utility elections. 
Uh, the co-op board elections are really important elections. They all happen in the spring. They're happening now. People who are members of co-ops who pay an electric bill have an opportunity um, to elect the people who, who uh, govern the management there. And that is critical. Uh, REAP is going to be soon endorsing candidates in these elections and we'll have our endorsements up on our website. Hey, do we want to do a brief closing statement? We'll start with Senator Wilikowski. Uh, I'll keep it very brief. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. This has been a fantastic discussion. Again, the bill that I'm sponsoring is Senate Bill 152. It deals with community energy. It will help uh, small apartment buildings, condo associations, groups of neighbors get together and, um, and, and uh, be able to pull their resources so that they can provide uh, solar, wind, hydro, geothermal to uh, themselves and their neighbors. And uh, we think this will help provide good resilience. It'll help lower energy costs and uh, take some carbon out of the air. Uh, I urge you uh, to contact your legislators if you think that's a good idea. Thank you. Senator Tobin. Well, thank you. And thank you once again for having me here to talk about renewable energy. You know, we talked about the short term, the midterm, the long term solutions. And I know that encouraging Alaska to generate more energy through renewables is the best long term option. Uh, I'm going to say something that Chris Rose said during our first bill hearing for Senate Bill 101, which is there are fixed costs associated with renewable energy generation, and it allows consumers to really depend on stable and predictable costs that don't uh, have the wild fluctuations in which we see of a potential importation of liquid natural gas. I want to know that my neighbors are able to stay in their homes, that they're able to thrive in Alaska. And the way I'm going to ensure that's gonna happen is to really pursue more energy generation through renewables. Uh, Hawaii is a state that has the highest cost energy uh, in, in our nation. Alaska is second. Hawaii has a legislation to have 100% renewable generation. They have a renewable portfolio standard of 100%. If they can do it, we can too, because we're awesome. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, and thanks again for, for having me. And, and also thanks to Senator Wilkowski and Senator Tobin for all the leadership on these issues uh, down in the legislature. I think there is a lot of support for this. We just need to, to uh, really rally people so that uh, the legislators know that people are thinking about these issues. Um, the Enroll report I mentioned uh, is a really interesting piece of work because it demonstrates the economics are on our side. Uh, we were talking about integration renewables, and that, that does have a cost. The annual report uh, believes that we would spend roughly $45 million a year to integrate renewables, and we would still save $100 million a year. So even after building in $45 million a year to integrate these renewables, the amount of energy is so vast that we would still save $100 million a year every year into the future compared to importing liquefied natural gas. That's independence. Alaska and Alaskans believe we are independent, but we are nothing close to independent now because we are really, really dependent upon one source of energy for both heating and electricity. And we're about to start being dependent on potentially another country for that energy. So this is about our character. It's about how we think about ourselves, but it's also about the resilience of our economy, and it's about energy security. So really so really happy to have so many people on this call. Um, thanks to uh, Alaska Common Ground for, for hosting these events. And please contact your, your legislators and vote in these co-op elections. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Senator Wilikowski, Senator Tobin, and Chris for your excellent presentations and informative discussions. Missing from this Zoom event, is the sound of applause that everyone watching tonight would like to give you. Special thanks to all who took the time this evening to attend this session to learn more about what's happening with these programs. One of Alaska Common Ground's goals is to help Alaskans become more informed and more engaged in issues important to Alaskans. If you are not a member of Alaska Common Ground, please consider joining by going to our website, akcommonground.org. 
all one word or all together, or make a donation to support our work to create more informed and engaged Alaska democracy. Now we'll close out this session, stay healthy and engaged. Good evening. And again, thank you to our presenters. Thanks everyone. Take care.